true republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. <clears throat> all right, I'd like to read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open, governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct substantial and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? Uh, there being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at our meeting this evening. Commissioners, are there any questions about any item on the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and the remainder of the agenda as published? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Great. All right. So the first item on the agenda is um, public comment. And we have a number of folks who have signed up. And the first person, um, let, me, let me read our protocol before I go through the uh, list. The time limit for individuals to comment to the board is three, three minutes. Um, you'll have a, uh, an orange light come on when you've got about 30 seconds left and a red light when your time's up. And we ask everyone to please discontinue talking once your time's up because we want to give everyone the same amount of time. Um, and please just share your name and where you live. All right, the first person that signed up, and I, I apologize if I mispronounce uh, anyone's names. Uh, the first person I think is Carly Schwartz on Salem Ave. Or Karen? Okay. okay. We'll go. We'll go with you. And we'll come back to Carly. Go ahead. Come on up. Yes, sure thing. And uh, and come over to the uh, come over to the podium and speak into the mic so everyone can hear you. Thanks so much. My friends, my name is Michael Schlotz. I live at 605 Riceville Road in East Asheville. I'm here today representing myself and Asheville Food and Beverage and uh, about the concern of parking in the city, particularly as it relates to those in the service industry. I thought I might just take a moment and share with you my story. Uh, I've been living down here for two and a half years, the entire time working in the food and uh, beverage industry. However, in the last year, almost exactly one year, I've worked at an, an establishment that has no parking consideration for its employees. And in preparation for this event, I have calculated the cost of parking for myself and my household in this last year, and with fines paid, with fines still owed, and then um, also with fines paid on site to legally pay for parking across the year, the figure represents between seven and 10% of my household's gross annual income, which is an extreme amount in my opinion, and I feel you all would agree if you applied those same numbers to your own incomes. The, um, <clears throat> pardon me. So yeah, in any case, uh, it's extremely expensive. I do my very best, I put in a good faith effort to pay, and oftentimes I'm paying via the app and still getting ticketed for windows of about 30 to you know, maybe 45 minutes where I'm unable to access my phone to pay because I'm doing service on the floor. Um, Food service industry in the city is extremely high demand. We see hundreds of people per night, and we do not get the opportunity to get breaks that are legally required in most uh, places of work. And so to this effect, um, I have incurred very much more tickets than an average person would, and I would appreciate any consideration that y'all could have for us just to make this situation a little bit easier, to make it less of a tax to work in the city. Um, there are many other considerations, some of which don't affect me as much, such as safety. As a large person, I'm very rarely accosted on the street. But I do have a wife 
who works in the, in the city as well, and I fear for her safety. Um, to park outside the city is to expose yourself to potential dangers, and we kind of just need some consideration for that as well. Um, we put in a lot of work to make sure that the people that come to this city are treated well. Service is an industry where many of us who are still in it are passionate about our work, and we are there to provide a good time for the people who are here providing economic consideration for this city. And so we ask that you just be in our corner on this, help take this boot off of our back, help us breathe a little bit easier so that we can bring positive Asheville energy to the people who come here to visit us, to spend money, and to keep our economy flourishing. Thank you guys for your time. We appreciate you. Okay. All right, thanks, Mike. All right. Um, tools Blumenthal. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jules Blumenthal. I've now lived in Weaverville for the last month, uh, moving to this area from Virginia Beach, an area that receives much higher tourism than Asheville itself. Um, on average, 70 million people are helped every single year in the city of Virginia Beach alone, and that does not include the outlying cities that nearby are also frequented. Uh, parking here, ever since I've arrived to work in downtown Asheville, has been through the roof. The most I ever paid in Virginia Beach was $7 for a day. Um, and that was the most extreme that you would ever pay. I was never happy paying that much, but you do what you gotta. But in order for us to have people working in downtown, in order to provide for the millions of tourists that visit here in Asheville, you have to be able to lower the cost of payment, of payment for parking for not just the employees, but also for the visitors. Having lower costs has been proven to increase the amount of people willing to work in an area, but also increase the demand for tourists to come to downtown. Sure, we've got West Asheville, and although I frequent that area quite often, I'd like to be in downtown more often. Most, pe most people that I've met and I've talked to about these issues since the one month I've lived here have stated that they refuse to work in downtown. They refuse to visit downtown simply because of the astronomical cost it is to park somewhere. If we look alone at the Pack Square parking garage on uh, Biltmore Street, it is $4 per half hour, capping at $20 for a day. That's telling people that if they're lucky and they make $20 in that first hour working as a server, as a bartender, that that whole first hour working went just to their parking. And that does not include the gas that they had to use to get to work, their car payment that comes out for every single month to pay for their car their insurance that they're legally required to have. It does not include all of these extra costs and it's just destroying the lives of people that work here. The people that work in the back of house and restaurants, they're making even less. Most people are lucky to make about 13 or $14 an hour being a chef, being a, being a bus boy, doing anything like that where they don't see a penny of tips and they're doing everything they can to keep that restaurant going. So you're telling them that their at first hour and a half that they're working doesn't matter. That should just be going to the city, going to the rich land people who own the land in order to pad their pockets when they're providing next to no service to the people. The state of, of the parking garages all across the board are not in great condition. This money is not being reinvested in the city. This money is going directly into the pockets of the rich. And it's disgusting. So I propose that costs be lowered for the parking for on all accounts to improve tourism and improve the workers' lives that are out here serving the city every single day. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jules. Um, Adrian, Michael, Michelli, thank you, sorry about that. Hi, my name is Adrian Michelli, and I'm very grateful to be here with you today. I live at 30 Graceland Road in North Asheville, and uh, I've been in Asheville for a couple years. And just like my friends talked about, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna talk about something totally different than what they said because I don't want to reiter re reiterate that issue. What I'm going to talk about is the time it takes for me to get to work. I work at the Asheville Beach Harbor, and we have two locations: one on Broadway and one on Battery Park. And it doesn't matter which one I'm at. 
it's, I have to calculate, okay, if I have to be at work at 11, let's just say, I have to calculate, okay, how much time is it going to take for me to leave, to find a parking spot, and am I going to be able to find one, and therefore, I have to leave much earlier, especially when I know it's tourist season, and there's many, many tourists here, I have to calculate that and leave a lot earlier, which takes away from my time, and, and things that I could be doing better than trying to drive around finding parking. So to me, that is, a, that is a huge issue that I have to, and I'm not getting paid, so I'm taking extra time out of my day to drive around. Sometimes I've had to leave as much as an hour earlier before work starts. And to me, that's just not sustain, sustainable, nor is it acceptable, nor is it a good way for, you know, to have warm fuzzies towards working downtown because um, I'm spending my personal time finding a spot. And then it, it's a snowball effect because that if I'm late, it's going to affect other workers because if I come in, let's just say I have a mid-shift and I come in and somebody's supposed to be leaving, then they have to stay later because I'm running late because I couldn't find parking. So to me, it's just a snowball domino effect. I'll just give a really quick, for instance, I was at the Broadway store, a coworker was at the Battery Park store. They were coming to cover for me because I had to leave at four o'clock. It took them an hour an hour to come from Battery Park to Broadway. And so I was stuck there. So that's the domino snowball effect I'm talking about. I was there because I stayed until they showed up. That's not fair for me. That's not fair for her. That's not fair for anybody. So my, uh, I, my take on it is, you know, same as them. And I agree with everything they say, but I also wanted to bring the time and also the pollution of do you know how many cars are driving around wasting gas? So we're, wa we're wasting gas and we're polluting the air more because of trying to find parking. So it's a big domino effect. It's a snowball effect. And without, without workers, there would be no tourism. So please, I respectfully ask you to do something to help us because without us, there would be no tourists. And that's the way I see it. And I just thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Adrian. <coughs> uh, Don Yelton. Don't see, oh yeah, okay, done. Well, we also know that Hendersonville just started charging for their own street parking, and that was something I kind of liked about Hendersonville. You could go out there and find a place to park and pull in. Now you can. This is an example, folks, of what I have brought up several times on some of your Zoom meetings and your long-range planning. There are limits to how many people you can crowd in one area without you make adjustments to take care of it. Period. End of discussion. Now, yes, people need places to park, so maybe you could do with that what I've been checking on and I'm still checking on, Maybe you could cut a deal with the employers where they could give free parking and let them deduct that from their profit, which would take taxes out of your pocket, and that might increase your debt service on these parking garages, which I've already heard. And I have requested from Don just this a while ago, and I didn't want to do it and catch him behind. I want to know what Buncombe County's debt service is and Avril, I asked him for each individual debt, and he said that'd take a lot of effort. So I'm prepared to wait to get that information, and I am requesting that as a FOIA. Now, if you want me to do it in writing, I will be glad to, okay? Secondly, I noticed tonight that we didn't have a moment of silence. First thing we do, we don't do prayer. I'm, I'm 75 years old, and I remember coming to these chambers and hearing different prayers. Jews, Episcopalians, Baptists, and it was a great learning experience. We didn't even have a moment of silence tonight. I want you all to think about that. I'm not a Bible-thumping preacher, but we do have to have some morals. Next, septic systems. It would be nice if you understood how a septic system works. And you can look at all these diagrams, and it's not going to tell you how it works. Because, folks, clay doesn't let septic systems work. And what do we have in a lot of the county, out in the county? Clay. And I hope you realize that when you flush your commode in the city of Asheville, 
you are subsidizing affordable housing. Yet you did not evaluate, I think you've decided to now, $75,000 to solve the sewer problem is not a drop in the bucket. It'd be better off to spend that money telling people how to maintain their sewer system. And that's coming from an environmental system engineer that has designed sewer plants. So if you want a detailed explanation of that, I'll be glad to give it to you. And yes, you go ahead and extend that sewer line because septic tanks are temporary, period. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Don. Um, Kate Ryba. Good evening, I'm Kate Ryba. I'm an Asheville resident, Tenmore Avenue, and also work at Urban 3 um, here in Asheville. And I'm here to talk about um, tax clawbacks and why they're important. North Carolina General Statute 105.312 outlines that the duty to discover and assess unlisted property, a process commonly referred to as clawbacks, is an opportunity under existing legislation that would allow for the recovery of some of the property tax revenue that has been lost because of underassessment of higher valued properties. This option should be exercised whenever additional property characteristics are discovered that were not previously taxed. In this circumstance, the assessor is obligated to collect back taxes up to five years with interest penalty. And you commissioners are supposed to get a report by state law of who was, um, who was affected by these clawbacks and where they live. That should be reported to the commission by state statute. A few numbers for context. In 2021 alone, from a very small sample of 2,000 homes in Buncombe County, there was an additional $96 million of untaxed value discovered. If clawbacks were appropriately applied to this value, that could realize around $4.5 million of revenue for the county just in 2021. Exercising this option to the degree required by state law could have really profound impacts to improve the inequalities we are observing in the assessment system. On July 15, 2022, Urban 3 submitted an initial records request to Buncombe County for all real property discovered notices sent to Buncombe County property owners in 2021. A week and a half later, we received a reply that the data was not available to staff in a, reporting, in a, re, excuse me, a reporting format. We followed up for more information on July 27, 2022 with County Assessor Keith Miller and he informed us that the county does not have real property tax discovery notices or associated data easily accessible and that to proceed with our request would incur charges to cover the labor necessary to retrieve and compile discovery data. He told us there would also be delays because staff would not be able to get to the work until after billing for the county was complete. At the time he said three to four weeks, which would imply the end of August. After several follow-up emails on August 2nd, Mr. Miller confirmed that our request was still pending completion and he would get back to us with a cost estimate as soon as staff had time to review. Today, September 6th, we've still not heard back. We understood through prior conversations with staff that discovery was not being exercised to the degree required by this section of the general state statute. This records request to the county confirmed this, revealing that, revealing that even to the extent that the discovery may be exercised sparingly, it is not being tracked or quantified. We as taxpayers um, and residents of Buncombe County deserve access to this data, and the commission should make every effort to be transparent and provide this data to the residents of the county. Understanding who is and who is not being asked to provide back taxes on an annual basis should be mapped, it should be quantified, it should be addressed and understood. Yep, your time's up, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for being here. All right, um, Carly Schwartz. Hey y'all, I'm Carly Schwartz. I've been living here for six years. I'm with Asheville Food and Bev United as well. I'm just gonna circle back on the parking issue. Um, I am, want to talk to y'all today about the safety of walking uh, to your downtown place of work, um, especially if you're trying to avoid paying for downtown parking. A lot of us park on Cherry Street and park in Montford um, and walk in around 3 to 5 p.m. Um, and then walk out at midnight, close to midnight, a lot of us. Uh, as you may know, Cherry Street has been getting a lot worse, a lot more dangerous, and there's a lot more people kind of lingering around the outer edges of Montford and Cherry Street and just around the outsides of downtown. Um, more recently, since there's a lot of people kind of congregating and things are harder financially for a lot of people, so they are living on the streets now. 
Um, anyway, that makes it more dangerous for those of us who have pockets full of cash, losing our jobs and trying to walk to our cars safely, which really in Asheville shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, we shouldn't, as the workers of Asheville, in a small town, have to worry about walking a mile to our cars and having to deal with uh, seeing people, avoiding people, that are, those are big city problems. Excuse me, those are big city problems and we shouldn't have to, in a small town where we move here to have a low stress environment, worry about our safety in and out of work. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I deal with the same things that everyone else deals with, with cost, I pay one eighth of my income as well to parking and I would be, it would be really great if um, we could have free parking eventually, but discounted parking is fine as well. Also, as a final note, if any of you haven't parked on Cherry Street or Momford, I would really encourage you to do that at midnight sometime or even 10 p.m. and just try walking into downtown and walking back out. Bring your kids if you want, see how it feels. I would like to you to experience what we have to do every day. Thanks. Carly, thanks for coming and sharing your thoughts. Appreciate it. All right, that's everybody that signed up. Is there anybody else who wishes to uh, address the board during public comment? All right, well, thank you to everyone who uh, took time to um, come and address the board this evening. We appreciate it. All right, um, we move on and we have a couple of presentations and <clears throat> the first of which is a proclamation recognizing Labor Day and Worker Appreciation Week in Buncombe County and Vice Chair Amanda Edwards is going to read the proclamation and um, Jen Hampton from Asheville Food and Beverage is gonna receive the proclamation. And uh, we appreciate everyone from Asheville Food and Beverage uh, coming out tonight and sharing your perspectives. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us, Jen, and to the other members of Asheville Food and Beverage United. It really is an honor to present this to you all this evening. Um, as we celebrate you all and the accomplishments of workers across Buncombe County and celebrating yesterday as Labor Day. So thank you all so much for your efforts. This is a County of Buncombe Proclamation, Labor Day Holiday and Worker Appreciation Week. Whereas workers serve as the backbone of the economy in Buncombe County and in towns, cities, and rural communities across our country, performing the essential roles from growing food on our farms building homes and manufacturing goods, teaching in our schools, providing health care, protecting public safety, preparing and serving meals in our restaurants, and many other services to the public. Whereas the labor movement in the United States helped bring about vital social change for the benefit of workers and created a stronger society, including the prohibition of child labor, creation of health and safety standards, expansion of the nation's middle class, and creating the process for people to have an organized voice in their places of work. Whereas in 1894, Congress established that the first Monday of each September would become a national holiday to recognize the nation's workers. Whereas in Buncombe County, to assure that all the people who work in our community can afford to live and prosper in our community, the effort to address the concerns of workers remains a vital cause to provide living wage jobs, safe working environments, affordable housing, health care, child care, and other needs. Now, therefore, the Buncombe County Commissioners proclaim the week of September 4th to be Worker Appreciation Week in Buncombe County in recognition of the Labor Day holiday and to express our appreciation to all workers in Buncombe County. Signed by Brownie Newman, Chairman, Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Jen, thanks for being here and the other members of your organization. And uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about what you're working on. I understand you have a couple of slides you wanted to see. And it sounds like we should have had in the proclamation of, as well, of course, to address the parking issue as well. So, but. <laughs> um, but I wanted to share, I mentioned this to Jen before the meeting, that at our briefing meeting this afternoon, the staff, uh, this is something this county is looking at, and the staff have presented a couple of different options for us to look at to address, because we are hearing that from the community loud and clear that that's a need. So um, 
you can uh, go to the county website and at our briefing meeting that we had at 3 p.m., there was a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that the staff gave. And so um, we're really looking for uh, feedback on these ideas. It's, uh, we think that um, there's some very good ideas coming forward, but we really would like to hear from folks who are most directly affected by it as well before we make final decisions. So Jen, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for this proclamation of Worker Appreciation Week. That's pretty awesome. Um, and I also want to thank Chairman Newman for reaching out to us and extending this invitation to come and present this issue to you all tonight. Um, like I said, I'm Jen, and I'm lead organizer with Asheville Food and Beverage United, which is a worker-led coalition of restaurant workers right here in Asheville dedicated to um, fighting for better working and living conditions for all service workers in the Asheville area. We are also working on teaching workers um, how to organize their workplaces if they want to and what their rights are as workers. We are also working with other community organizations to build networks to try and provide for I'm sorry, we are working with other community organizations trying to network and collaborate to solve these issues together. So we're really trying to take a collaborative approach with local government and with other communities and business owners as well. Um, we're also working with some com commun community organizations to provide a lot of aid to our workers with housing costs or you know, financial crises that come up with from being sick, not being able to take time off because we don't get paid sick time in our industry. So we are, like I said, we are fighting for workers. We are, have like close to 22,000 workers in Asheville work in the food service industry in over 900 restaurants. And as I'm sure you know, these workers contribute an economic impact of like $3 billion and we service around 11 million tourists every year. So we really think that that really wouldn't be anything without our labor. There would be no tourism industry in Asheville. So we've been talking to workers about our Fair Deal campaign, which is fighting for living wages, paid sick days, and better scheduling practices. And in doing that, talking to workers, we discovered that while those issues are super important, they're also, as you can tell, very upset about the parking issue. So we decided to do something. We started a petition asking for free parking um, and reserved decks, or reserved levels for workers in the city and county owned parking decks. And we also are gonna work towards expanding transit access because that would help with the safety issue if we had some sort of shuttle. Um, so aside from that, we're gonna take it to the city to work on the transit issue. I know that the county can't do anything about that. I just wanted to make that little note. So our, our petition, which I brought with us today, a physical copy of everybody who signed it. We have over 2,000 signatures that we gathered in about two weeks. So people were very excited to sign that petition. And you've already heard from the workers what they have to say about it. So we think that every worker in the city should be entitled to free parking very close to where they work. You shouldn't have to walk a mile to get to your car after work. Um, and I believe that you all can do that. I, I'm really looking forward to and excited to see what those proposals were that Chairman Newman was talking about. Um, and I really appreciate you guys for having us up here and I know that we can work together to do something about this for what we think is this city's most essential workers. Thank you. All right, Jen, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate everyone being here and we do look forward to your feedback. It's not a proposal for free parking, but we feel like it's a big right. step in, uh, in a good direction. So but we look forward to talking, talking with everybody more about it, who works in uh, your industry and all the folks who, who uh, come downtown. All right, thank you, thank you again. All right, um, and, um, yeah, and folks are welcome to stay if you wish, but if you, if you wish to uh, go as well, that's uh, uh, certainly totally fine too. Uh, the next um, item under presentations is Early Childhood Education and Development Committee, and Rachel Nygaard, our Strategic Partnerships Director, will present this item.
Good evening, commissioners. Rachel Nygaard here, Strategic Partnerships Director. I am not here as your presenter this evening. I'm here to introduce the presenters. Um, I will be passing um, to members of the Early Childhood Education and Development Committee, um, beginning with Leslie Anderson, um, proceeding to Wendy Weber, and then also Kit Kramer, who will walk you through the material in today's presentation. This is our annual update as um, funding committees that are appointed by and report to the Board of Commissioners are invited to come in and, and share. And as part of this annual update, they'll be sharing with you about sort of the state of early childhood education in Buncombe County and the latest results of the work of this committee and the fund. So I'll pass first to Leslie. Thank you so much, Rachel. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Leslie Anderson, and I live in North Asheville. Thank you for the invitation to report on the exciting and challenging work of our committee. We begin with a reminder of the connection to the county's strategic plan. As you know, the plan includes the important goal of kindergarten readiness within the educated and capable community focus area. The years of prenatal to age five or six are crucial in shaping a child's foundation for later school success and throughout life. With the return on investment of up to 13%, the benefits of investing in high quality early childhood education are clear and extensive for children, adults, and society at large. A substantial research base confirms that when children zero to five years participate in high quality early, early childhood education, they are, for example, more likely to graduate from high school, less likely to commit crimes, less likely to be unemployed, less likely to require public assistance, and generally are healthier and able to be more productive among just some of the findings. <clears throat> You are making investments in early childhood education because you know in our county we have major gaps in access to affordable, high quality early care and education, and that led to its selection as a county strategic plan goal. And now, on to the update. The primary way that Buncombe County is working toward its goal of increased kindergarten readiness is through the early Educa childhood Fund. This fund was established in response to barriers that exist within the early care and education system, such as a sort of qualified teachers and staff in classrooms, as well as a high cost of care for families. Early learning can cost more per year than tuition in a North Carolina university. The fund was established in 2018 with its first funding year in 2019. It began with $3.6 million and grows by 2% annually. The Early Childhood Committee, who we represent, was formed to guide the Early Childhood Fund through community engagement, public input, as well as policy and funding recommendations. <coughs> and here is a look at our current crew. 15 early childhood committee members as appointed by you. The membership includes three members of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners, Al, Jasmine, and Robert. I believe I speak for our committee when I say we are honored to be serving and working with these fine elected officials. Some members serve in designated seats on the committee. For instance, business or economic development professional, funder or community investment professional, a parent, pediatrician or medical professional in service to young children, professor or higher ed education professional, retiree from the field of early childhood education. And there are six members of the public representing the community at large. I must admit, we are a knowledgeable, dedicated, and stimulating group. <laughs> 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 the, 
The committee strategy for recommended investments of the fund is to support early care and education for children birth through kindergarten with an emphasis on pre-kindergarten. Now, when we say pre-kindergarten, we mean children four to five years old that are rising kindergartners. This includes and is not limited to NC Pre-K, which is a program of the state of North Carolina it's a Division of Child Development and Early Education. We fund projects that work to increase the number of children enrolled, increase quality in every dimension, develop, expand, and diversify the early childhood workforce, support families, and enhance the effectiveness of the overall early care and education system. In this evening's presentation, we're including an annual report on grants for the county's fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. Here is the list of organizations who received grants from the Early Childhood Fund. You'll notice a mix. There are larger, more in institutional organizations such as Buncombe County Schools, as well as community action opportunities who operate Head Start here. And you will see smaller or newer child care centers represented here, such as the Christine Avery Learning Center and Evolve Early Learning. We're also proud to include organizations that are not child care centers and are part of, a, of the larger early childhood system that serve children, families, and the early learning workforce in different ways, such as Collaborativa La Milpa, On Track, and Read to Succeed. Here are examples of projects operated by these grantees. Again, what we hope will stand out here is the diversity of the projects, the services, and the grant levels. The projects include everything from classroom expansions and operations to much needed supplemental support such as behavioral health and parent engagement. There's a strong emphasis on workforce development to recruit, support, and retain professionals in the field. We'll touch on, touch on this topic again in just a bit. At this time, I will pass on to com committee member Wendy Weber, and I thank you. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you all for being here and supporting this wonderful endeavor. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of performance reporting. Once the grants are awarded, county staff work closely with the grantees to set up performance contracts. These include scope of work that defines services, deliverables, and performance measures. Grantees submit quarterly reports on their project performance, including updates on activities, progress toward goals, and use of funds. These grant reports are published on the Early Childhood Fund website, and we encourage commissioners and members of the public to follow along with the work. Continuing with our annual report on grants from fiscal year 2022, we want to highlight some takeaways from the grantees' quarterly reports. 71% of all goals were met across 21 funded projects. This is a lower level of goal attainment than we would expect in a regular year as a result of COVID. The goals where we saw the lowest attainment were around enrollment, attendance, and staffing. For example, only 20% of goals were met for number of slots and enrollment percentage, and only 50% of goals were met for student attendance. We did see that grantees had good success on goals related to student achievement. 89% of these goals were met. Yay. The impacts of COVID um, continued in fiscal year 2022, and the field of early care and education was especially hard hit. Some examples of what we heard from grantees, young children were not yet eligible for COVID vaccinations through the majority of the fiscal year, 
It wasn't approved until June 18th by the CDC. Programs were unable to have as many classrooms open due to lack of staffing, and the classrooms that were open, they had to clean repeatedly. Enrollment was lower as families chose other care and learning options. Sometimes they chose, sometimes their circumstances chose for them. Non-program staff were repurposed for classroom operations. T teacher and student attendance was impacted by COVID exposures and infections, and volunteer engagement was limited and often curtailed due to public health precautions. Many programs mentioned in their end of year reports how they addressed the increasing social and emotional needs of students during the trauma of the pandemic. A report cited in Fortune magazine, 2922 from Child Care Aware America, stated that nationwide 16,000 child care centers and licensed homes shut down between December 2019 and March 2021. Those that could stay open had to be both sensible and sensitive in their ability to respond to family needs during the height of the pandemic. Although our data show that important spots and entire classrooms for young children were lost or shuttered in Buncombe County, many of the programs the commission funded nimbly managed to weather the storm and were able to improve outcomes for young children. Examples of success um, are on your screen. And uh, despite the challenging times, there were plenty of successes to report on. Um, some of the examples from our grantees uh, in their anecdotes that they shared with us, um, the Family Child Care Network Project said, we met goals by pivoting and adjusting our approach and our community engagement to meet shifting needs. And anyone who has spent time with a just three-year-old or more than one three-year-old will appreciate this comment from Christine Avery Learning Center. We were also able to have the toilet in the three-year-old classroom fixed, and it is now <laughs> operative. <laughs> That's a big yay. <laughs> Evolve Early Learning stated, we are learning how to interview and enroll so that our classrooms are balanced, inclusive, and work for staff. We are operating on a wait list for fall and beyond. An on-track secure program participant stated, I had an incredible experience, and I'm so proudly blessed to say I'm a homeowner now. I continue to save and learn valuable debt relief tools that I share with others. Thank you. And here's a statement we received from Spanish-speaking members of the Colaborativa La Milpa, uh, and this is their translation. We feel very proud to have had access to knowledge training. The trainings have been so focused and of such value to learn more about the development of children under five years of age. Since most of the members of the cooperative and network are Spanish-speaking immigrant women, and, and although their knowledge and experience on childcare is extensive, with the received theory and practice, they have been able to provide not only care to the children of the community, but also now provide education regardless of language. Here's a look at the impact of the Early Childhood Fund over time. With the 14.8 million invested so far, we supported the creation of 393 new slots. Existing slots supported is a count of all the licensed child care slots operated by organizations that received an Early Childhood Grant that year. In early learning, the term slots reflects the number of children served. It gives a picture of the reach of the fund in any given year. I really love this photo because to me it means more slots mean more friends able to learn more together. At this time, I will thank you and pass to committee member Kit Kramer. Good evening. As we said at the start, the reason we have an early childhood fund is to improve community conditions. There are several community indicators that we watch, including this information about the number of children served. We want to see an increase in the percentage of children in the community who are served by licensed early care and education programs. Because participation in high quality early learning is a factor that increases kindergarten readiness. 
These charts reflect the percentage of children enrolled in licensed care over time. The top chart in orange and blue shows all children from birth until kindergarten. Currently, 29% of all children in age range, within this age, age range in Bunkle County are enrolled in licensed care. The bottom chart in the green and blue shows pre-kindergarten age children, four and five-year-olds not yet in kindergarten. Currently, 51% of children this age are enrolled in a licensed program. The trends over time don't show the steady upward curve that we'd hoped for, and we know this is because of COVID. And many of us in businesses and organizations across this country are going to see similar types of curves. 2018 is a benchmark showing where we were prior to the establishment of Buncombe's Early Childhood Fund. 2019 is year one of the grants, and 2020, when the lines drop downward, is when COVID hit. Several programs reported wait lists for this fall's enrollment, so we look forward to the future and that this graphic will look considerably different. Even before the pandemic, there was a workforce crisis in the field of early care and education. Factors that contribute to this are the strict levels of education, credentialing, and training requirements, combined with the generally low levels of pay for these positions. When COVID-related workforce shortages began, this exacerbated an already challenging situation for early education. The number of employees working in licensed facilities has dropped from 1,045 in 2019 to 869 in 2022. We do need to share a disclaimer on this data that this reflects all employees of all child care facilities licensed by the state that are located in Buncombe County as the state doesn't break out data for the zero to five workforce. Kindergarten readiness is a key community indicator re related to this work. Until recently, we haven't had good information about the kindergarten readiness as our school systems were each using different assessments. Starting in 2020, we now have a unified assessment, which is a, that is a source of, of great pride for us. And we're very, um, we're, we are thankful that our school systems have worked together to unify this assessment. North Carolina ELI is the North Carolina Early Learning Inventory. This formative assessment measures ch children's proficiency across 14 measures. Seven of these measures, the ones in the boxes at the top right of the screen, are the ones we look at, which address early language, literacy, cognitive, and math proficiency. We know that this isn't a, per a perfect assessment. I'm not sure there is when you've got this many domains related to small children that, that you can definitively say this child is ready and this child may not be. Um, uh, another limitation is that data is not available for charter, private, and home schools, which together represent a growing number of students in our community. But all limitations aside, it is a big deal that we have one unified assessment. We're very proud of that fact and very thankful for the work that has gone into making that happen. Here's the North Carolina ELI data from 2020, the first year of the new assessment and the most recently available data at the time that these slides were put together. 1,819 children in the Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools were assessed. Of those 1,247 children, were 69% met or exceeded the majority of the selected objectives, four of the seven indicators we talked about. The North Carolina ELI data has revealed the troubling fact that at the, at the time of kindergarten entry, there is already an achievement gap. On the previous slide, we shared that 69% of all children assessed met or exceeded the proficiency standard for the majority of objectives. Here you'll see that this number is lower for children of color than for their white counterparts. For example, 56% of black children met this threshold on the assessment in comparison to 75% of white children. So there's still much work to be done in closing the achievement gap. 
We are pleased to have this new data partnership and look forward to working with the early learning partners and the school systems to implement what we, what we find. We will be able to study the impact of participation in pre-kindergarten programs and how that impacts children's kindergarten readiness. We will work to understand more about the disparities. We will have information over time to be able to map trends and impacts. And importantly, we'll be able to adjust our investments and programming in accordance with what we learn. Before we continue this evening's presentation, we want to take a moment to add a bit of information about a special project related to our Early Childhood Committee. While this is not funded through the Early Childhood Fund that we've been discussing this evening, it's one of the most innovative and bold steps that our community has taken to expand kindergarten readiness. The NC Pre-K Expansion Project is being led by Buncombe Partnership for Children and funded by the county's COVID recovery funding through the American Rescue Plan. The Partnership for Children has been awarded $3.2 million to build capacity to expand North Carolina pre-K in Buncombe County. The pilot project just launched for this school year is intended to result in lower teacher turnover, increase provider participation in NC pre-K, and reduce barriers for families. The project will increase stability and equity among existing North Carolina pre-K providers, expand the pool of high quality providers and licensed teachers, and make it easier for eligible families to learn about and take advantage of NC pre-K's proven benefits. Our committee will be following along with this work and keeping the commissioners posted about the project and its impacts over the next two years. In summary, we want to say thank you for your investment in this very important program. Not only are we building a, an infrastructure for workers in this community to house their children while they're going to work, we're building the skill set and the brains of those children who are our next generation of workers. So it's, a, it's an important investment. We appreciate that you're making it on an annual basis. We also appreciate the trust you've placed in the program and doing this additional $3.2 million to work on systems that can help us expand, um, expand pre-K. We're proud of the impacts that we've made so far. There's more to be done and hopefully not in a pandemic so we can see, so we can see trend lines that will make us all happy. We'll, it'll be easy, easy to tell where the pandemic was during all this time. We have strategies in place to build a strong and equitable recovery from the pandemic and continue advancing early care and education as a keystone of a thriving Buncombe County. And we so appreciate your leadership. Do you have any questions for, for me, for my colleagues, for Rachel, who is the uh, subject matter expert, whether she wants to be or not? <laughs> uh, any questions for any of us? And I'm really cognizant of the fact that, that three of, our, of your, your members today have already heard this presentation once. <laughs> and we so appreciate their leadership and involvement on the committee. Well, I have a couple of questions. First of all, I'll say thank you. And as far as that, those trend lines you're talking about, my hunch is if you hadn't done all this really good work, it would have been worse. Well, thank you for saying that. Somebody else made that comment, and we, we appreciate that. There's, there was tremendous creativity and diligence shown by the child care community yeah. throughout the pandemic. And I'm curious, when we were looking at the graph, how many, do you have an idea of the certain percentage of people who are wanting this service that aren't able to access it at this time? Do you have a sense of those numbers? Rachel, do you happen to know? Demand for early care and education is one of the things that's hard to exactly pinpoint. When we were setting goals, for example, for NC pre-K participation, um, we targeted 75% of the available eligible um, children in a community because not everybody will choose that that's the right um, fit for their family. Um, 
right now we have demand information at the center by center level in the, in the form of wait lists. And we have an upcoming um, centralized portal of entry, single portal of entry, which will help us get better at telling you about demand information in the future. Okay. I'll just be curious when we get a chance, I'd love to see how many are on the wait list just to have some sense of that would be useful. Well, and again, I don't have data, mm -hmm. but I do, I hear from employers every day who are talking about the, trying to attract people. So not only do we have issues around the availability of childcare, it, it, it's affordable housing, it's all those things that workforce wants. People want to be here, but we've got some basic barriers to their coming. And just one more question. As you know, we, we have a lobbyists that we work with and we look at addressing things at the state level and I'm curious with the early childhood are there any policies that we should specifically be paying attention to that we should be advocating for at the state level? Well uh, we were actually talking about this earlier today on the chambers the chambers public policy committee has put together a legislative agenda and we've discussed the need for supplements, salary supplements for childcare workers, because this is core economic development infrastructure. And in an environment where it's difficult to get workers, those barriers that exist need to be knocked down in order to get people back to work and to be functioning in society. We would love to see the General Assembly. We were pondering ways that we could work in collaboration with other communities throughout the state about a salary supplement because while, while we are doing some really exciting things with our, our local dollars, we're concerned about the sustainability of that over time. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, on behalf of Commissioner Survey and the committee, I want to thank the three of you and staff for the hard work that went into this presentation and the whole committee for the work represented here. Um, and just lift up again something that was referenced a few times, but I think bears repeating is that, um, you know, one of the most significant things that's happened in the last few years is the ability to um, direct resources into some of the retrofitting and infrastructure needs that are required so that we will be prepared to begin scaling access. So that's things like the single portal of entry. That's things like having a um, consistent way to assess kindergarten readiness so we can really track the efficacy of what's happening. Um, and it's certainly what's about to happen as the um, pre-K pilot moves forward. I understand um, an update from the partnership that uh, local pre-K centers will begin receiving that local supplement um, by the end of this month. Uh, so that funding is about to start flowing into those centers. And I think we're really about to enter arguably the next phase of this um, longer long-term work. Um, and uh, to your point, uh, Terry and, and Kit, Certainly, I think what we were able to do is stem the tide of what would have been much more drastic uh, reductions and impacts on f for families and centers through the last two years. So thank you to the full commission for always showing up on this issue, um, not just through the annual funding, but also through American Rescue Plan funding and really understanding how deeply it's tied into a lot of the fundamental issues we're trying to work on around housing and, um, and pay for folks. And uh, just really appreciate all the ways that the county shows up on this. All right, Anything great. <clears throat> great presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Al. yeah. All right, commissioners. We do not have any public hearings. Uh, Ms. Pender, no, nothing right. under the county manager's report. No old business, so we come to new business. And the first item is the 2023 insurance benefit changes. And Sharon Burke will present this item. I believe we have our consultant here as well, Larry. Sharon Burke and people. Good evening, commissioners. Hello. Good evening, commissioners. Um, tonight, um, Larry Reese, who is from USI, he's our broker, and he will be presenting the actual recommendations for fiscal 23 benefits. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been a little bit since I've had the pleasure to be in front of you. It's nice to be back, and there's been some favorable developments since we were together last. Uh, I'd like to walk you through those. 
Uh, it's a short presentation. I think there's maybe 12 pages. And I think, uh, let's see. So for tonight's agenda, we're going to walk you through year-to-date financials, so 2022 calendar year uh, through June, but I have an update uh, through July. Um, the calendar year forecast for, for uh, 23, uh, that's an update since you've seen it last, very favorable update, and then some options for 23. I think there's a couple of different directions that the committee might consider going. Uh, so that's our agenda for our time together today. Um, first on the financials, how are things running year to date? Uh, slightly unfavorable, actual claim costs are running about 4% above forecasted claim costs for the health, health insurance programs. You're an employer self-funded program, so you pay those claims as they come in. Blue Cross is just an administrator for you. You pay them administrative fees. So on a claim basis, slightly unfavorable. This is through June. I shared with you that I was able to uh, get July data. It's always a month in, the, in arrears. Uh, July was favorable, and it, it turned uh, the year-to-date unfavorability from 4% to about 2% unfavorable. So things are moving in the right direction. Um, just to give you an update on where you're spending some of your money, you have 17 large claimants, over $125,000 is what we consider to be a large claimant in, in calendar year 22. Eight are employees, nine are either spouses or children. Of those 17 claimants, how are they enrolled? You have three different medical plans. So there's just dispersion around enrollment. We just share that data point just to suggest you don't have adverse selection to any one plan. It's kind of evenly divided on large claimants. Um, but these are just some statistical data points that suggest that the program's doing really well. Um, the, the Blue Cross discounts that you have are 50% of charges. That saved the county $23.5 million in the most recent 12 months. Uh, there's some clinic engagement data points here that I think are interesting and, and should be um, embraced by the county leadership. I think staff, HR, and the clinic and Blue Cross program behind the scenes are running really well. Um, your nurse support management engagement is, is saved about $361,000 in care avoidance. That's fantastic. Your member health engagement rates are 15% um, or, or actually at 15%. Book a business norm for Blue Cross is around 11 that doesn't sound like a lot. That's really amazing, guys. So that's things like uh, member engagement programs, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, low back pain, autoimmune diseases. That means your employees are getting the message at the clinic from HR, and they're enrolling in these programs, and they're taking the advice. Uh, your generic utilization, so that's just a marker that says when there's a lower-cost drug, are your employees taking that drug as opposed to a brand? We look for that to be at 86. You guys are at 88%. That's, I, I know these are small percentages, but they're fantastic results. Your medication possession rate, that means if somebody's on a maintenance med, could be allergies, could be asthma, uh, could be something more, more significant like a beta blocker. Um, your medication possession rates are really good. So people are not only filling the script, they're taking their meds, and they're getting their, their scripts filled. Uh, we moved formularies a little over a year ago to a more low-cost focused formulary. That saved almost $700,000 in the most recent 12 months. So fantastic results that speak to the collaborative work that's been done in the past and the integration of the clinic and some of the other efforts in, in your wellness and uh, health management programs. Uh, a, a couple of more data points, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, copay maximization program, that's a pharmacy program that leverages into uh, pharma coupon programs. So uh, it doesn't cost the employee any, and in order to save the county uh, money, this program can be leveraged. You guys started about a year ago, and you've already saved $279,000. Uh, RX Saving Solutions, not quite as popular yet. It'll, it'll grow. Uh, your, your associates will, your employees will begin to use this program more, but year to date, uh, it's saved about $1,300. Um, diabetic adherence to evidence-based care is 20% above normative. So again, that's Diabetes is, is probably the biggest killer in the U.S. today. Uh, that's no different in Buncombe County. So it's nice to see that adherence to evidence-based medicine is, is higher than norm. Uh, diagnostic imaging program, so that's where you get an MRI, for example. Uh, there's, a care, there's a program to steer that care to the most cost-effective place, and that saved the county $49,000 this year. Uh, and ER and urgent care utilization are below normative data, which is where you want to be. Uh, you don't want ER visits if you can avoid them. So that's a good, that's another marker that suggests the clinic's working and the clinic hours and the clinicians are well-respected and admired by your employees because they're being used. 
Um, and then preventive care screening. So that's colorectal screening, other mammograms, pap smear screenings, routine physical examinations. Those are above normative data. Again, your associates and covered family members are, are paying attention, taking the advice of the clinic and having screenings done. So that adds, all, adds up to favorable performance, of about 1% above norm. And I know these are small percentages when you look at them, but it's really favorable. So um, it's nice to be able to share that because I know the last couple of times I've been at the podium, it has not been favorable news. It's been pretty challenging. So that was a lot really fast, but I, I think it ties together the success the program's having. Uh, it leads to a revised forecast. So the translation of, of that news and, and favorable recent developments is the, um, the calendar year 23 forecast is a little more favorable. To kind of set the, the uh, 23 forecast in context, the 22 forecast is about $33.5 million. With the county picking up the majority of that, you see a 30.7 million, and the employees picking up uh, a little over uh, 2.8 million dollars. And so, for calendar year 23, there is a forecasted increase. Please keep in mind, healthcare trend is running about 7%. So, um, and and from my side of the table in employee benefit consulting, when we see forecasts that are south of 7%, that's very favorable. That suggests some things are going well in the risk pool and the disease burden is mitigating, so that's nice. Um, this increase, uh, option one, would be to keep your three programs as they are today. So I started with the, the uh, county offers three medical plans, no changes to those plans, no changes to the network, no changes to the prescription drug program, basically no changes, no changes to employee premiums. Um, if you went with option one, it'd be a 2.35% increase to the county to fund the program for next year's budget, and that equates to conversationally about $800,000. Option two would be keeping most of option one intact, but adding a fourth medical plan. And that plan is known as a qualified high deductible health plan. Uh, you might originally have known as consumer driven health care, high deductible health plan, but it'd be adding a fourth plan, uh, keeping the other three plans as they are today, uh, just adding a fourth. Employee premiums wouldn't change. The employee premiums to enroll in the fourth plan would be the same as core or, or maybe mildly favorable on the single if they were wellness compliant. That increases a little bit more. Uh, it's $888,000 is the estimate. It's 2.6 as opposed to 2.35. Um, so those are kind of the two options. I'm happy to walk the, the group through. Um, uh, here's a good visual. The, the top of the page is the three plans that you offer today. The bottom of, of the page is those three plans again. And with the add of the HDHP, High Deductible Health Plan, um, and the yeah, network benefits. Um, the, the county is, is recommending in the first year to fund the entirety of the deductible. So for a single, that'd be $1,500. And for a family, that'd be $3,000. So basically the translation on that, this is a very favorable way to introduce a qualified high deductible health plan, very favorable. That coupled with the employee premiums uh, of being identical to core, make it um, probably the most favorable and optimal way that you could ever introduce a qualified high deductible plan to your employee base. Um, this just goes a little bit deeper in what is a qualified high deductible plan. Um, the one that's been designed, again, you're a self-funded plan sponsor, so you're able to design it how we want. We worked with staff and leadership to design it. The deductible would be $1,500. There are some legal minimums and maximums in plan design features. It's IRS tax code. These meet those, there, it is within the um, legal minimums and maximums. So the plan design would uh, be IRS compliant. Uh, the deductible would be $1,500 for a individual and $3,000 for the family. Coinsurance would be 30%. Out-of-pocket maximum would be $4,500 and $9,000 for family. And then as I had previously mentioned, the premium or employee payroll deductions, if you will, would be identical um, to the core plan with the exception of single. And for those that elected it and single and they were wellness compliant, uh, it'd be actually be cheaper than, than core. Not remarkably, but it would be cheaper. So that's a, a fantastic uh, way to introduce that. And then again, the county would fund the HSA account. And just administratively, they, they would, uh, the proposal is to do that, that 1,500 and 3,000 in thirds. So at different intervals during the calendar year. That's because HSA money becomes the um, owner. Uh, when you hand, when the uh, county hands or any employer hands, an employee HSA funds, those funds become uh, owned by the employee on the day they're, they're handed to them. So it's not a notional account, it's real money and it moves to their side of the table. There's no vesting schedule. 
There's no clawback. It is their money on the day that you hand it to them. So that's the reason for uh, three different intervals. Um, second year funding would not be 100% match. It'd be a 50% match, and that's more traditionally what you see in the marketplace. Uh, what makes a high deductible health plan different? Well, first, it has some tax advantage status that allow a consumer to open an HSA, allows a plan sponsor like Buncombe County to actually hand money to employees. And you do that in a tax-free way. So that money goes to their side of the table uh, dollar for dollar, and, and they own it. And it's theirs whether they stay at the county or not. They have it into perpetuity. There are no co-payments. So one of the downsides a lot of people feel about high deductible health plans is how come there's no pharmacy co-pays? How come there's no doctor visit co-pays? Can't have co-pays, just part of the law. So co-pays aren't available. However, preventive care, so routine physical examinations and preventive screenings, you can still do it 100%. So um, your employees and associates would not uh, suffer in their preventive care compliance and their health status and screenings um, by joining the Qualified High Deductible Health Plan. Um, happy to go deeper. This, so this just gives you a little bit around the context. It is tax-free. Um, you have to have a minimum balance. So these are kind of consumer laws. Um, your employees would actually be opening an account. If you handed them, if they chose the qualified high deductible plan and they opened an HSA account, in the example of a single, the county would be handing them $1,500. If the balance was at $1,000 for I think it's six to nine months, then they, those are investable assets. So think IRA or 401k or, or 403b, they actually would have a menu of, of investment options to pick from once the balance stayed at a certain place. Um, withdrawing the money, uh, it's untaxed as long as you're Section 213, that's referenced to an IRS code, but those are the deductible expenditures. Uh, unlike flex, flex is a use it or lose it, so everybody knows the FSA money on the medical reimbursement side. HSA is a little different, no use it or lose it. In fact, a lot of people use it to save money and then they pay their Medicare premiums at retirement because it can be used for that. In fact, that's number six on the list. Um, and employees can make their own contributions above the, the county contributions outside of payroll. So I moved through that relatively fast. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I think the gist of it is uh, either a 2.3% increase or a 26 so that's extremely favorable. I, I hope the board receives that as favorable news tonight. And the increase is somewhere between 800 and 888, that depending upon whether... Uh, it's the board's desire to maintain the three plans or have the three plans and add a fourth. Um, and, you know, this is probably worth mentioning. People tend to overinsure themselves, so given the option of three plans, people don't always pick what's optimal for themselves. Um, it's just counterintuitive. We all overinsure ourselves. So you might be surprised to know that 40% of your employees uh, would be better off enrolled in the qualified high deductible plan. Um, I'm by no means suggesting we've run all kind of scenarios. I, I think if, if the group were to uh, offer the fourth medical plan, you might have somewhere around 40 or 50 employees take it. Uh, again, with option one being no increase to current premiums and they like their current plan, I don't know how long they would consider an alternative. We'll certainly do our part in the communication strategy to help encourage some of these 40% to seriously consider it. Uh, but by offering it, a wide swath of, of your employees would benefit from it. Hope that's helpful. Uh, let's see. Am I, am I doing the answer? Keep going? Yeah. Okay, so for the ancillary programs, I think this is just uh, maybe for your uh, edification. Delta Dental is your current dental provider. Your employees pay 100% of their premium, so we call that voluntary dental plan. The, the increase is about 8%. And it's a two-year deal. The deal after that, the year after that, it's a six percent increase. Um, and we had some issues with uh, the whole life program and Voya and some data, so we're going to move that to Transamerica uh, for ease of enrollment administration, and then for the um, basic life insurance and short-term disability insurance. There's um, Lincoln Financial uh, had a much more compelling proposal than U.S. Able, so the recommendation was to make that move to save a little bit of money for the county and improve the benefit offering to associates with a higher guaranteed issue on spousal life and on employee supplemental life. Um, so, and I, I know the long-term disability is also 100% employee paid, but this is just informational for you guys to know. Just 
program. Anything to add to that one? No, okay. Um, and so I'll be happy to, to take questions or whatever's appropriate next steps for the group. All right, sounds great. Commissioners, <coughs> questions, comments? I have one question, and this might be for the county manager. So with the, if we go with the high deductible plan, so the first year the county will fund it 100%, and that will only be if they go ahead and sign up this first year, right? Okay. Yes, ma'am. And then after that, there will be 50%. Correct. Of, okay, for e each year thereafter. Okay, thank you. Uh, this for you too. <laughs> so uh, they can change if the high deductible, I mean, there's nothing going to change really, are they? It's just adding the fourth one on, correct? That is the proposal tonight, yes, sir. Oh, so they can change from year to year from high deductible back if they want to? Yes. During open enrollment, they can pick any of the four plans. If you choose to go with a fourth plan, they can pick any of the fourth plans. And that'll be every October during open enrollment. Commissioner, I do need to pick which option you want to go with. Thank you. Sure. All right. <clears throat> do we need it as a motion? Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion that we go with adding the additional high deductible plan. A second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hey, thank you for the update. Thank Appreciate you very it very much. much for your time. All right. The next up, resolution designating designating official bank depositories. Don Warren, finance director, will explain. Good evening, commissioners. Hope you're all doing well. So we have some housekeeping we need to do. We uh, are required to, we, not we, you are required to name our official depositories for the county. Um, has not been updated since uh, October 31st of 2000. As you can imagine, there's a few that we need to add as things have changed, banks have merged and that sort of thing. Um, so the resolution specifically names Wells Fargo, Regions Bank, Bank of America, First Citizens Bank, Truist Bank, and U.S. Bank as official depositories for the county. I'd be happy to answer any questions on any of the depositories or anything else to do with this resolution. Don, I've got a question for you. Um, I guess how often do we change banks um, um, under these, these categories and then under what process does that occur? Um, typically, if we won't, we don't typically change our main operating account, which is at Wells Fargo. But when we issue debt, there are different banks that may um, take the escrow funds and hold those. So we would have to add those as official depositories. Um, if we decided to change our procurement card program to a different uh, bank, then we would have to come back to you and do that same thing. So, not very often, but more often than 22 years. Gotcha. I guess, yeah, just to let you know where, where I'm going with that is, is at, at a future date when we're thinking about that or, or going through that process for changing any of these, I'd, I'd be interested in, in the board giving feedback on um, you know, selecting a bank that maybe aligns with our values uh, to the best of our ability that still meets the needs of the, of the county and mm -hmm. um, our deposits and that sort of thing. So, Okay. Thank you. I will take that under advisement. Motion to approve the resolution as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Thank you. Next up, we've got a couple of budget amendments. First, for reissuance of CDC COVID-19 vaccination program. And John Hudson's here to help us out. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Budget amendment for the reissuance of CDC COVID-19 vaccination program. This budget amendment reissues the second of two pandemic-related agreement addenda that have carried over from fiscal year 22 to 23. 
AA 716 CDC COVID-19 vaccination program in the amount of $388,445. This will allow Health and Human Services to continue coordination and expansion of vaccine services and will fund contract nursing staff, temporary communication staff, medical supplies, and also support the HHS mobile unit. I'll make a motion to approve the budget amendment. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And budget amendment for FY 2022 budget carry forwards. This is an annual ordinance to carry forward funds that were budgeted in fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23, totaling $5,338,888 in the general fund. $725,549 in the transportation fund and $16,249 in the solid waste enterprise fund. A large portion of these funds are related to goods or services purchased in fiscal year 22, which were unable to be delivered in fiscal year 22. The largest amount is related to economic development incentives budgeted in fiscal year 22, for which we have not received a requestment for disbursement. A second ordinance transfers $3,048,000 of these dollars to the multi-year special projects fund where we have budgeted multi-year incentives for fiscal year 23 forward. Other reasons for carry forward are receipt of single year grant revenue delayed from fiscal year 22 and general fund grant match that was not transferred in the prior year. The majority of the revenue for this budget amendment is appropriate fund balance with some grant revenue and intergovernmental public health funding. I move to approve the carry forwards as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, we have some board appointments on the County Board of Adjustments for reappointments. I move that we reappoint Catherine Morasani, Gabe Quisenberry, Wesley Green, and Tim Henderson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And Home and Community Care Block Grant Advisory Committee. I move that we reappoint Greg Zornis. Second. All in favor of Greg Zornis say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Chairman um, Newman. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to come back to an item that we spoke at the last meeting about interviewing for the planning board. Um, we said we would re uh, take up this issue on the time that we can do interviews on the 20th. I think it was in, in question about doing it at 1 p.m. We do have five applicants that we potentially can interview. So um, just want to touch bases and make sure that 1 p.m. time or if that time needs to be adjusted. Which date did you say? Um, it, at the next meet, we talked about doing a special meeting if we needed to, but um, it was in question for the 20th. That's typically when we have our interviews, the second meeting in any month. But if okay. we need to have a special meeting, we can do that as well. That was on the table as well. I think we already have some comp plans scheduled at that time, a three by three. What time is that? One o'clock. And it's gonna, then that'll go till three. What about, so we have five interviews? Correct, uh, potentially now that may change with who's available okay. and who may drop out, but that's the max um, that we, we have. We could do like 11.45 and uh, get it done. It's a long day, but um, probably most people, well, the, it's the, oh, but the, the comp plan is like a three by three meeting, so there'll be three commissioners here for that. Okay. Well, um, would y'all be open to doing like an 11.30 meeting that day? And then uh, sure. some people will be in this comp plan meeting, some people won't, but we'll be coming back that same day for that. So um, 11.45 or 11.30, it's like 11.45, too weird to like <laughs> pick a time. Let's do 11.30, 11.30. And then maybe we'll have time for a snack or something in between that. We, we can supply lunch. If supply lunch. Okay. Sure. Feed we'll, us. We will take that. Okay. Yeah. That's that'll that'll get us off here. All right.
right. Uh, hang on, let me go ahead and make a note. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. All right, uh, commissioners, uh, I've got a quick announcement. Uh, we do have our next county commissioner briefing meeting at September 20th at 3 p.m. at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. We have our next regular meeting at September 20th, 5 p.m. at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. We do have a need for a closed session, um, and Mr. Frew, will ex could you explain the purpose? Yes, sir. Uh, we need a motion to go into closed session pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11-A-5 and A-3. Under A-5, to uh, discuss the price and other material terms of possible property acquisitions, and under A-3, to discuss with the attorneys employed or retained by the county. Uh, we don't anticipate any need to come back in open session. We just need direction from the board. Thank you. Commissioners, I do want to remind you that we had scheduled a work session on the 27th. We talked about it, but I don't think we've ever formally done planning for a work session on a comp plan on September 27th. Yes. But a joint meeting with the consultants on the 27th okay. to talk about policies and goals and vision. That, I forgot about my calendar already. What time? Yeah. Three o'clock? I think it was at 10. Okay, and it's 10 o'clock? 11. 11. 11 till 3. 11 till 3. Okay. We, yes, we sent. We told you to save the date before, but I just want to publicly say so we can actually advertise it. And All right. Thank you for the reminder. Is there a motion to go into closed session? Motion to go into closed session. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are in closed session. <laughs> 